little bit anyways, right? Uh, okay, so uh, everybody had a good weekend? Rested up and ready to go? Not yet? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this week, okay? My goal is to finish this uh, thing uh, Thursday. You guys will be here Thursday, right? So uh, I'm going to hand out the books Thursday and tell you what all this means. You know what I mean? Like we'll get done with it, tell you what all these yeses and nos mean for you and so forth. And then um, Friday I'm going to be gone. Uh, so what I was thinking I would do is have the sub hand out the rest of the books to the other half. And uh, hopefully that's Coach Holman and um, give an assignment. Uh, so while you guys are home, uh, there won't be a video. Uh, I'll give you that assignment ahead of time. I'll put it in uh, Canvas. It won't be anything really difficult, and it'll be due like next Tuesday, something like that. Okay, give you plenty of time to work on. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. So let's see if we can get through some of this here uh, quite a bit today, uh, and I'll hopefully finish tomorrow. I'll tell you what it means on Thursday. Hand out books. Good. Okay, uh, so we got to uh, number uh, through number 17, and we're on number 18, opposed the bailouts for auto and financial industries, okay? So, guys, we got to go back to 2008, and I know you guys were just youngins back then, uh, but we had a really bad economic breakdown. And I don't know if you remember hearing about this. Um, they called it the housing bubble, okay? Um Basically, guys, property values in this country were rising, 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 and they were overpriced. Um, we had so many people buying homes in 2000, you know, leading, leading up to 2008, okay, that the property, because when there's high demand, prices go up, okay, and so the prices kept going up, um, but the problem was a lot of those people that were buying houses, really couldn't afford their mortgages. Yeah, you guys know what a mortgage is, right? I mean, that's a, that's a loan to buy a house. Most people don't, you know, just put up $120,000 in cash and buy a house. Most people get a loan. That's a mortgage, okay? And you pay it. Most people do this over 30 years, all right? Now, the lower the interest rate you get, the better, right? Because I remember when my parents bought a house in 1976 in Indiana. And it was a hundred thousand dollar house in 1976. That's a nice house, okay. And interest rate was 13 and a half percent. Today, interest rates on a 30 year mortgage are about three and a half percent, which is awesome. Okay, I hope it's like that when you guys, you know, are able to, you know, think about buying a house. Interest rates are low like that because it makes it so much cheaper to borrow money, and that's what was going on here. So. Uh, the government was really encouraging people to buy homes. When people are buying homes, guys, guess what? Somebody's building homes. Somebody's building that house. Somebody's cutting down the, the trees for the wood for the frame of the house. You've got all types of construction workers, right? This is really good for the economy. This is really good for the economy when people are buying and building houses, okay? And so... Uh, the government was encouraging banks to give out loans. Now, there's a movie on this, and I don't know if anybody's seen this. It's it's called The Big Short. You saw that? Yeah. Okay. Um, that is a little bit of a crazy movie, but uh, it's based on this this whole event, okay? And um, so we had a financial crisis, okay? And can I explain this to you with your ability to understand this, I think I can. Okay, let me tell you uh, how this just kind of went down. I'll try and give you the short version, all right? But, okay, when you buy a house, you get a mortgage, okay? Mortgage, okay? Okay, so all of us in this room are going to get a mortgage, okay? Now, some of us are... Uh, better able to pay that mortgage than others, okay? So what kind of credit do you have? Have you guys built up any credit at this point? Like, okay, I have all, 
awesome credit. You see the commercials, right? The credit, you know, check your credit. Okay. I have awesome credit because I pay my bills and I pay my bills on time and I have for decades. So I actually have higher credit than my wife. Okay. Which last time we bought a car, I was like, yeah. Okay. But anyhow. If you have good credit, it's easier to borrow money because the banks know that you're willing, you pay your bills back. If you don't have good credit, they don't have faith in you, so they charge you more to borrow money. Because banks will, they'll, they'll loan me money any day because they know I pay it back. But a lot of Americans don't. They have bad credit. So your mortgage rate, rate your interest rate, okay, is going to go up or down based on certain factors. If you don't have a steady job or you haven't had a steady job for more than six months in your lifetime, they're not going to loan you $100,000. Okay? But the government was telling them they wanted you, they wanted to loan people more money so they, they could buy houses. Okay? And there is a little bit, just, just full disclosure here, guys, there's a little bit of a racial... Uh, tinge to this because what some in Congress were saying is that banks are not lending to African American and Hispanic lenders as often as they are white people and they're saying that's because of their race okay if you're a loan officer hopefully you're not looking at somebody's race you're looking at their credit their, their credit history, right? That's what you would base whether you can give this person a loan or not. But the Congress got involved and said, you need to give more loans to minorities and more high-risk borrowers. So really, it was the Congress, and they don't really talk about this in the movie. The Congress was putting pressure on the banks to give out these loans, okay? Now, these mortgage rates, you have a couple different kinds. You have fixed, okay? So for the 30-year loan, a fixed interest rate of 3.5% is great, okay? But then you have what are called variable rates that fluctuate, that go up and down based on interest rates as a whole. So you may start at 3.5%, okay? But if interest rates go up, yours is variable, so your interest rate goes up. Okay, so both of us are paying $900 a month on our, our mortgage. That's our mortgage payment. That pays interest, a little bit of the principal, pays for your escrow, your insurance, and stuff like that. These are things you'll learn when you buy a house, okay? But anyhow, $900 a month. Now, if this interest rate goes up to 4% because it's variable, and they give these to high-risk lenders. Okay, you got to read the fine print. Okay, and I'm telling you right now, and I know you won't remember this, but never get a loan with a variable interest rate. It's a bad idea. If it goes down, I guess that it's good. But if it goes up, guess what happens? Your payment. Your payment goes up each month. And if you're just barely able to pay this $900 now, because the bank's giving you a loan, they're like, hey, you can afford this house based on what your income is. Yeah, you can afford this. A lot of people like to live beyond their, you know, their, their, their abilities. My dad was kind of like that. Okay. Uh, good morning. And so, this is a problem. First of all, these are already high-risk borrowers, okay? Now that when the interest rates went up, their payment's going up, which means they're not going to be able to make their mortgage payment. What happens when you can't make your mortgage payment? They foreclose on your house, okay? The bank owns the house until you pay it off. You understand? Okay, now, this is what went wrong. Yeah, because so many people were buying houses and getting mortgages, okay? Investment companies saw an opportunity to make money, to get cash flow, okay? So they take what they would take about 500 mortgages, okay? 
and they would bundle them. And they would, these banks would sell them to investment companies. Okay, so if you buy a, a package of 500 mortgages, guess what you're getting in every month? Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, okay? Now, these are expensive because, you know, there's a lot of mortgages. It's a bunch of houses, 500 houses that you're buying, and then, and then these people are paying you for them every month, okay? So these big investment banks like Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America started buying these big bundles of mortgages. But inside these 500 mortgages, you had a lot of these questionable ones. You follow me? I think I've explained this pretty good, okay? There's a lot of these questionable ones, okay? So say there's 200 of the 500 are variable interest rates. These are pretty solid. These are not solid. And then all of a sudden, the, the interest rates start kicking up and people can't afford to pay their mortgages. These big banks like Bank of America, Goldman Sachs are going to be stuck with all these bad mortgages. Basically, you're going to be stuck with 200 houses. What's Bank of America going to do with 200 houses? Or 20,000 houses. Okay, this was a bubble and it burst. Okay, and so when Bush was leaving office in 2008, and Obama was coming in in 2009, the crap hit the fan. Okay, and Bush went on the TV and said to everybody, we've got to bail out these big banks or they're going under. Okay, and then Obama gets on too. I mean, you got the outgoing president, the incoming president, both saying this, this is a crisis. And I tell you, go back and look at Obama's speeches in 2009, and you will hear him use the term crisis, economic crisis, over and over and over again. Heard new President Biden talk about it this week, using that word, crisis. Okay, now this is something I teach my history students about. Whenever there's a crisis, and you guys learned about this without you maybe not even realizing it. During the economic depression of 1930s, we were in a perpetual crisis, economic crisis. More power goes to the national government. More power goes to the president when you're in a crisis. Okay, whether it's after 9-11, we were in a crisis after 9-11. The government got more power. Okay, so the government says we, the taxpayers, need to bail out these big banks to the tune of trillions of dollars. Now, to be fair and honest with you guys, the banks got all this taxpayer money. They did pay it back. Okay, but some of the banks got bailed out and some of them didn't. The reasons why they said we had to bail out the banks because businesses in this country borrow money from Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, and others every day. And if these big banks shut down, if they go under, who's going to loan them money? The Obama administration bailed out two of these big banks, the two I mentioned, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. There was a third major bank called Lehman Brothers that went under. They didn't get bailed out with taxpayer money. So what you have here is the Obama administration picking winners and losers. They get to pick which banks survive, which ones don't. Now do a little research and you'll find out that there were a lot of people that formerly worked for Goldman Sachs and Bank of America in the Obama administration. So they had friends in high places, these big banks, and they got taxpayer money bailout, okay? Now, who do we blame for this? Now, the movie, The Big Short, blames the banks that this was predatory lending, that they were giving these loans to people that couldn't afford them. But who was pressuring them? Congress was pressuring them to do it. And then you have the borrowers, borrowers themselves. Guys, like I said, don't ever borrow money on a variable interest rate. Your credit cards, credit cards are variable. They can change the interest rate on your credit card anytime they want. Okay, that's why if you ever get a credit card, you pay it off every month. Okay, if you use your credit card as, you know, I need some extra cash, that's what you're using your credit card for, that's not a good thing. 
because you're not going to be able to pay that off. And the interest rates on credit cards are really high. I mean, we're talking 12, sometimes 15. Sometimes they'll jack it up to 20%. Okay, and they'll say, oh, you only have to pay $10 this month. Well, the interest on what you owe is more than $10. You're not even knocking any of it down. Dangerous business, credit cards. Okay, and a lot of Americans are in trouble on credit cards. I had a buddy that had over like $35,000 on a credit card debt. It's crazy. Okay, especially with those high interest rates. So, who do we blame for this? Well, I think you blame everybody. You got to read the fine print. You got to be smart. Don't get a loan you can't afford. Okay? That's crazy. Okay, you're going to have foreclosing on your house. And guys, there were foreclosures all over the country. The fastest growing city in America during this time period was Las Vegas, Nevada. And they were putting up three, four, five hundred thousand dollar houses left and right in Vegas. Whole neighborhoods, okay? And people were moving there, they're buying these houses. Well, when the economy slowed down, guys, they couldn't afford it. So let's say you buy a $400,000 beautiful house in Las Vegas, okay? You borrow $300,000. You put down $100,000, okay? You borrow $300,000, okay? Now, when the housing bubble hits, these $400,000 houses are not selling for, nobody's buying them anymore. So now these, these are selling for $250,000 in Vegas. How much do you owe on it? You owe $300,000 on a $250,000 house. This is called being upside down in your mortgage. Why would you make payment on this when your house is only worth this? So people didn't. They're like, screw it. We're just going to leave. They moved out. You had whole neighborhoods that were empty. These beautiful houses in Vegas, okay? And the banks were stuck with these houses. And we bailed them out. Now, if we didn't bail them out with the crap that hit the fan and all these businesses couldn't borrow money from anybody, I don't know. Then you go to uh, General Motors. You guys all heard of General Motors? Some of you guys might drive, drive a GMC car or something like that. Well, they were in trouble. General Motors was in trouble. And so the Obama administration said, okay, we're going to bail out General Motors to the tune $50 billion of taxpayer money to bail General Motors out. They had run that company into the ground. They were going to go through bankruptcy. Obama said, they're going bankrupt. Okay, now, one thing you got to know about this country, guys, is that you can go bankrupt and stay in business. You guys heard of the United Airlines? Anybody ever fly United Airlines? Yeah, they're still flying. They've been bankrupt before. Okay? American Airlines, Chrysler, has been bankrupt. But they're saying General Motors is going to go bankrupt. 25,000 jobs are going to be lost. Not just the, uh, not just the uh, people that build cars, but the people that sell the cars. What about those dealerships that sell GM cars? You're going to lo lose a lot of businesses and, and jobs there. Okay? But, guys, not necessarily if you go bankrupt. What, the, what you do is you go to court, and General Motors owed a lot of money to different people, different banks generally. And generally what happens when you go through bankruptcy is they say, okay, we're going to help you restructure and pay off some of this debt. Your creditors that you owe money to, they're not going to get all their money back. Okay? But instead of allowing them to go through the bank bankruptcy process, we just bailed them out with tax dollar money. So basically what the government did was bought up $50 billion of General Motors stock, okay, so that the government was now had the majority of the shares of General Motors, which we can now start, start calling it government motors because they own it. And the goal was that with this influx of money, they would restructure the company. Obama fired the CEO of General Motors, personally handpicked the new CEO of General Motors, and then the government tried to sell back the stock to the public, okay? 
They ended up doing that for $30 billion, and so the American taxpayer took a $20 billion hit on this by bailing out General Motors. Now, if General Motors did go out of business, do we have other car manufacturers in this country? So, yeah, we're going to lose some jobs, okay? But the other auto manufacturer in this country, they're going to have to make more cars to fill that gap. Does that make sense? So they're going to hire more workers to build more cars. Ford Motor Company, Toyota, Hyundai, all these companies. And I don't know if you guys know this, a lot of uh, foreign cars are assembled in the United States. In places like Huntsville, Alabama, okay? It's just cheaper to do business. You're going to sell the car here. It makes sense to assemble it here, okay, instead of assembling it overseas and then bringing it in on cargo ships. We do some of that, okay? But um, anyhow, did Ford get $50 million of taxpayer money? Did Chrysler? No. Dodge? No. No. Why then? Okay. There's another company called AIG. $85 billion bailout. Now, what we began telling these major companies that had tens of thousands of employees, that they were too big to... The government can't let them go under because they're too big. They're too big to fail. Now, is this the message we want to be sending to corporate America? You can run your companies into the ground, mismanage them, and the taxpayers of this country will bail you out because you're too big to fail. Is that the role of the federal government? To bail out these big businesses with our money because they're mismanaged? Now, I don't know what would have happened if, if Bank of America and Goldman Sachs went under, like Lehman Brothers. I don't know what the consequences would be. They said it was going to be dire if they did. Now, I know we could have recovered if General Motors went out of business. Of course we could. Okay. Somebody else is going to fill the market. You know. Somebody else is going to step up and build more cars. Make money. So, the big banks kind of scared, okay? So you might like say, ah, maybe we had to fill, you know, come in here and bail them out, okay? Um, but then you have these other companies. Is that something? Is that the role, okay? So based on just kind of hearing that, okay? Uh, how do you feel about this? Do you think this is the role of government to bail out? Uh, big companies like this, financial industry, when they're really in trouble. You decide. I know it's a lot. Okay. But I, th I, think, I, I think I covered that pretty good. I, I think I explained it where you guys could understand it. Um, so, good. I'm kind of proud of myself because that's a tricky, that's hard to understand. Okay. And maybe <laughs> maybe you didn't understand. Maybe you did. I don't know. Okay. But I got to move on. Okay. All right. Number 19 is pretty easy. Okay. Now listen, um, this goes, this is kind of how you feel about things. Now, um, the Supreme court said in 2017, okay, that I know the first day I talked about this amendment, the 14th amendment, okay. The equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. Okay. So, it says that all, all citizens have equal protection under the law. The law can't treat you differently based on your race, uh, your religion, and your national origin. That's what it says, those three things. Now, ladies, I got to tell you something. This was passed after slavery. Okay, so this was equal protection, really what they were saying for, for black people, okay? But really what they were saying for black men. 
colored men. Not black women, not all women, just men. All men. Okay? Um, you guys, let me try and explain this, ladies. Um, do you remember this court case? I know at some point you've probably heard of this. Brown versus Board of Education. You've all heard of this, right? This is Topeka, Kansas. This is dealing with school segregation. Okay, so when we had uh, Jim Crow laws and segregation, we had uh, in pl certain places where uh, black students were not allowed to go to white schools, and white students, white school, white students didn't go to black schools and stuff like that. They were segregated by race. Okay, that was a violation of this. Okay, in Brown versus Board of Education in, in uh, 1954, Brown. said these words, separate is not equal. You with me? Separate is not equal. Ladies, where in society are we separated by gender? Right down the hall, right? You got a women's room and you got a men's room, right? They say women's or boys and girls. Sorry. What do ours say? You say men and women? I, I just don't remember. I just no big deal. But uh, okay, where else? Locker rooms, right? Sometimes like at dormitories, right? Like when you go to college, they'll have female dormitories, male dormitories, okay? Uh, or wings, you know, wings of the school or of the dorm. Um, so men and women are separate today, today. So separate is not equal. See, guys, if we said that you couldn't have separation of the genders, then you couldn't have separation of the genders. So, ladies, you have tons of protections in this country. I mean, the law, laws that protect you from certain things like discrimination, okay? But you don't have, this doesn't protect you. Now, we didn't think it protected, see, it doesn't say for uh, sexual orientation in there either. It says for race, it says for religion, and it says for national origin. It doesn't say uh, for sexual orientation. In 2017, the Supreme Court ruled that the 14th Amendment gave e equal protection to the same-sex couples to marry. Because straight couples can marry, heterosexual people can marry, but gay people couldn't in some states. Okay, this is one thing we're going to learn here, guys. Marriage laws, driving laws, those are state laws. They're not federal laws. Marriage laws are not federal. They're state. When you get married, you get a marriage license from the state you're married in. Mine's from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yeah, that's where I got married. Okay, so Kansas has to recognize my gay marriage. Or my gay marriage. <laughs> no, I got a picture of my wife somewhere. I'll show you. Okay, and, but anyhow, uh, they have to recognize my marriage. Well, when Massachusetts, guys was the first state in the union to allow for gay marriage, there was a big concern that Kansas and other states would have to recognize a gay marriage from Massachusetts. Okay? When they didn't want that in their state. So Congress passed back in, two, and this is in the 90s, like 96, the Defense of Marriage Act that said one state doesn't have to recognize in other states gay marriage. They have to recognize my straight marriage, but not the gay marriage from Massachusetts. And then Hawaii had gay marriage, and then California had gay, you know what I mean? And then it started, we started getting up to like 15, 16, 17 states that had gay marriage, and the others that didn't, and people move in this country. You know what I mean? What are the advantages to marriage? I gave you one the other day on taxes. If, you, if you're married and you're filing jointly, you pay less in taxes than if you're living together. And if you're not, if you're gay and you're living together and you're not allowed to get married, then you don't get that benefit. You would think. Okay? 
visit hospital hospitalization visitation. You know, say only family can go visit this. You know, in the in the ICU. Well, if you're not married, this is the person you're closest to in your life. Then uh, you can't go see him. Or when it comes to like uh, when somebody dies, the will. Okay, or if they don't have a will, and the person they've been living with, a gay partner for 30 years, isn't able to, you know, get was what was coming to them from their partner because there was no will, and it's going to go to the family instead of their their loved one. Okay, so you can see reasons why same-sex couples want to get married because there's benefits to it. So some states said, well, how about civil unions? We won't call it marriage; we call it union. You get the same benefits. Well, that didn't fly since this is unconstitutional, this law. Okay, because the Constitution says that one state must recognize another state's official documents. That's called the full faith and credit clause. You get your driver's license out, guys. Okay, it says Kansas on it, but every other state and union has to recognize your driver's license as legitimate. You can drive in all 50 states with your one from Kansas. Same thing with the marriage license. Okay. So this, this law was unconstitutional. They knew it when they passed it, but the Supreme Court didn't overturn it until like 2014, okay? So it stood for almost 20 years. But in 2017, they said equal protection clause protects uh, same-sex couples, they can get married. Is it in the Constitution? Does it say that? No, it doesn't. But they found it there, or they created it. Because this is the difference between those people that feel like the Constitution is a living, breathing document that can change with society, or those that feel we should stick to the strict view of what the founder said in this document, or we should make it up as we go along. Now, let's say I love two women, and two women love me, and we want to get married, the three of us, or the four of us. Maybe there's a third. What's that called? It's called polygamy, right? All right. Well, equal protection, right? We all love each other, the four of us. Why can't we get married? I love my dog. I want to marry my dog. Do dogs have equal protection? I don't know. Maybe they can find it in there. Okay. The fact of the matter is, guys, gay marriage is not going anywhere. It's it's here to stay. Okay. The only way to go back to marriage between one man and one woman is to pass a constitutional amendment, and that is to change the constitution to to define marriage to between one man and one woman. That's the only way you'll ever change it. Now, does that have any chance of passing two-thirds of both houses of Congress? No. Does it have any chance of being ratified by 38 states? No. So it's not going to happen. Okay, it's here. to stay. Okay, now, attitudes, guys, on this have changed so much. In just the 23 years I've been teaching. You know what I mean? If you would have proposed this amendment back in the 1970s, it may have passed both houses of Congress and 38 states may have ratified it. But that ship is sailed. So this is more of a hypothetical, you know, how do you feel about gay marriage? Okay, so like I said, attitudes have changed. People are like, well, it doesn't affect me, so you know, I don't care. What people want to do, that's all right. It doesn't bother me. And some people say, well, it's kind of a detriment. To society, okay, um, for moral reasons. Okay, so um, yeah, just where do you fall on that? Okay, you guys have your own attitudes on that sort of thing. Okay, I'm getting a new pen. I'm tired of these, these crappy things. Okay, Title Nine. Anybody know what Title Nine is? You do, but you don't. Ashton, are you going to try and play college volleyball? You got a place yet? Yeah. Okay. All right. Title nine 
part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Remember affirmative action? First thing we did where, where it tries to help minorities, right? Through uh, whether it be you know, government contracts for businesses, getting into college and that sort of thing, right? Okay. Title IX says that our universities have to have the same number of scholarships for male and female athletes and adequate facilities for both. So, like, if you do something to fix up the baseball field, like, say, we got lights on the baseball field here at Bishop Carroll, you would have to put lights on the softball field. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, you've got to have equal facilities and uh, the, the same number of scholarships for male and female athletes. Okay, now, they really didn't start enforcing this till the 1970s, and today it's fully implemented. Okay, so um, the biggest problem with Title IX is called college football. Okay, now college football, do you know how many full rides the University of Alabama or the University K State University has for football? Full ride. You know? That's how many Alabama have. Now, is there any other female sport that has that number of scholarships or that many athletes? Okay. Wichita State women's track has 60 athletes. Their men's track has 60 athletes. Okay, track teams can be pretty big. Okay, so you got a lot of different events and you know, so forth. Okay. Um, I think it's 60, okay? But they don't have 60 scholarships for women's track or men's track, okay? But women's track is likely to have more. Now, Wichita State doesn't have football. So it's a little easier to manage at Wichita State, okay? But if you go to a big football school, they got to do one of two things. They have to cut male scholarships for men or add new sports for women. So like at KU, they have women's rowing. Heard of this? Okay. And you could probably get a scholarship for women's rowing at KU because you're a good athlete, you're strong. Okay. And we've had, I think, three girls from Bishop Carroll that got scholarships to row at KU who had never rowed a boat before. Okay. Because you, you know, it's usually some bigger girls that are strong and athletic. Okay? Because they can teach you how to do this. <laughs> okay? But if you're real small and skinny, you know, it's, you're, it's harder for you to do this, right? You know what I mean? Okay, so they add women's sports or they take away men's sport. At K State, they have women's soccer. Do they have men's soccer at K State? So the biggest. Damage is that these are the sports that get hurt the most by men, for men. Men's wrestling, men's soccer, men's baseball. Okay, now, guys, Title IX has been awesome for American women. Okay, I have a girl, I have a daughter, she's an athlete, okay? She may choose to do college sports and maybe get a scholarship for that. Okay, so I'll tell you where this has really paid dividends. We go to the Olympics every four years, every two years now, right? The most dominant team in the world, the most dominant team in the world are American women. When it comes to Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics, American women dominate. Okay? They win, American women win more medals than any other group in the Olympics. Period. And a big reason for that is Title IX. Okay? It gives women opportunity in this country that they didn't have before. Okay? But at the detriment of some men, and mostly because of college football. And, you know, not everybody loves college football. I love college football. I'm a Saturday guy, not a Sunday guy. I have been watching the NFL playoffs. It's fun. 
just because there's not much sports on. And, you know, I'm like, I'll watch the NFL games. Because if I, I had to choose when I got married between Saturday and Sunday, you know, like my wife's like, we're not going to watch football all weekend, are we? I'm like, okay. We'll watch football on Saturday, not Sunday. Okay. So I'm a huge college football guy. Some of you guys are like K-State fans and OU fans. and You know, I'm a Buckeye fan. So my team's always good. I like them. I, so Saturday's for me. But if, in a perfect world, maybe you could just take college football out of the equation and then have equal number of scholarships. The thing is, guys, most of these sports don't make any money. They lose money. College football at these big schools, guys, raises so much money that it helps pay for women's rowing at K-State. Now, it's probably the basketball team at K- women's rowing at KU. It's probably the basketball team at KU that pays for the rowing at K-State or at KU. Okay. But the, the, the only sports that really garner any revenue are men's basketball, men's football, now, in some cases, if you look at, say, Wichita State volleyball, women's volleyball, they're in the top 16 prior to the pandemic, top 16 of attendance in the nation. Wichita State women's volleyball, a lot of people go watch. I mean, it's not packed, but they get a lot of people. Okay? That probably pays for the program. Wichita State baseball used to be a national powerhouse. And that X Stadium, which is huge right now, it's usually pretty empty. Okay, hopefully that's going to change. You got a new coach there, Eric Wedge, and hopefully Wichita State baseball is on the rise again. And, but I tell you guys, I don't know, when you guys were little, maybe not even then, but Wichita I mean, they built that huge stadium because so many people were coming to the game. You guys know I'm talking about X Stadium on campus at Wichita State? You been there? You seen it? It's huge. Okay. They used to pay, be able to pay for themselves. I don't think they do it anymore. The men's basketball team sells out every time prior to the pandemic. That brings in a ton of money. Any Shocker fans in here? Dude, i tell you what. Greg Marshall changed the trajectory of Wichita State University, not just the basketball team, but the whole college. He put us on a national map. We went to the Final Four. We're 35 and 0. You know what I mean? And so people were like, I want to go to Wichita State because of the craziness around the basketball team. It's awesome. Dude, just look at the expansion of that university in the last 10 years. It's huge. They closed down the golf course and built all these buildings on it. I used to golf there. That was my home court. Hole in one on number 16, par three over the water, 145 yards and six iron. Went straight in. Okay. That's there's a building there now, <laughs> some type of like you know engineering school or something. All right, so guys, this is a tough one. You know what I mean? I you know if you have sisters and you're a girl and uh, you know what have you, you're, you're going to be a parent. You want these opportunities for your girl? Yeah, of course you do. It's good for women, but it comes at the detriment of some men. Our wrestling coach. If you go back and look at state championships, we used to have a guy, rest, uh, wrestling coach here named Mark Stovall. Okay? Stovall was a Division I wrestler at LSU. And they brought him back in, uh, uh, at the end of the season. They brought him together and said, guys, we got to tell you something. we got some bad news. He was on full scholarship. we got some bad news. We're shutting down the wrestling program. It was a Title IX. Um, Northern Iowa, which in the Missouri Valley used to be, and the Shockers were in the Missouri Valley. They shut down their baseball program about 10 years ago. There's no more baseball. And with the pandemic, guys, we could see a lot more of this. Because you're not bringing in the big bucks from the football teams anymore. Unless they start letting fans back in. This is going to really affect college athletics for men and women. All right, so Title IX, it's not a perfect world. You can't just take football out of the equation. you got to make a choice. It's tough. 
This one I just put on here, number 21. Okay. This was, um, I knew it was going to be coming up when Biden was elected. Okay. And he signed an executive order this last week saying that biologically, biological male athletes who identify as women will be allowed to compete in women's sports. Now, there's only one state, Idaho, that has passed a law saying that this couldn't happen. There's other states that are considering this legislation. Okay. You guys know this has already been happening, right? So, like in track and field, uh, you're a runner and you are one of the best. Well, we have one of the best right here in our school, right? Hope, right? Hope Jackson. She's incredible, isn't she? She's like the top runner, female runner in the state of Kansas. She's elite. Okay. How will she do against elite men? I mean, she'll beat a lot of our guys, right? She'll beat a lot of our guys. But our elite guys, she's not going to beat. She's, she's one of the best. And so she works her butt off in cross country and track. And then this guy, that's a guy, decides he's going to be a girl. And she's been hoping for the state championship her whole life. And this guy, you know, and if you feel like that's okay, then obviously you know how you're going to answer this. Uh, it does affect women, uh, and there are people that are transgender, and there are people that feel like they're trapped in a body that is not right. You know, something's not right. And so this is the direction we're moving in this country. Okay, and if we go to unisex, guys, where everybody gets to go to the same locker rooms, the same bathrooms. And this is going to happen. This is happening in the high school, in the public school. Okay. How long will we be able to hold off of that as a private school, as a religious school? That's going to be interesting. First Amendment, freedom of religion. Let's see what the Supreme Court says when that one happens. All right, guys. Uh, I'll see you Thursday. Make sure you tune in tomorrow, guys. Okay?